Today women are involved in football more than at any other time in the history of the sport. Both on and off the pitch, the role of women is expanding as enthusiasm for both the men and women's game continues to grow in popularity at all levels. At Exeter City, opportunities for involvement extend right across the football club, with women involved in all aspects, from the terraces to the boardroom and right through to the senior teams. In this short film, we take a look at both the historic and contemporary roles of women in football to highlight this aspect of our football club's culture and heritage. The earliest link between women and football in Exeter goes back to Lady Anne Clifford who owned a piece of land in St Sidwell's ward of the city that would later become St James Park. The direct involvement of women in football in Exeter is by no means a recent phenomenon. In the early 20th century, around the time when St Sidwell's United were battling to become the leading association football side in the city, women's teams were seen in action as the game grew in popularity alongside the men's game. In Exeter, the first women's match was held as early as 1889, when North v South played against each other at the county ground in St Thomas. Crowds with both male and female spectators turned up to cheer on the players. There is a perception that grounds were entirely populated by men in the early years of association football, but images from the archive show that women, although a minority, still regularly attended St James Park to support the Grecians and the club attracted praise from local newspapers for the diversity and enthusiasm of their crowd. While the women in the crowds drew plaudits, the attitude towards female footballers did not strike the same positive tone, with an article in the Devon Next Gazette stating, Athletics for girls, within due limits, are very well, but football is emphatically not a ladies' game, and I think that the modern young lady, even if the matches were played under association rules, would shrink from taking part in the sport. In spite of the negativity shown towards women playing the game, the doubters were proved wrong as matches continued to be played across Exeter and Devon, with numerous contests organised for charitable purposes as well as for leisure. As a sport, ladies' football accelerated in its popularity during the First World War, as women took on positions traditionally held by men in order to support the war effort. During break times, workers began to play informal games of football, and after some initial unease, their superiors came to see them play as a means to boost morale and to encourage productivity. As a result, more official teams were formed, and the number of friendly matches increased. However, just when the structure and popularity of the game had grown to a successful level, in 1921 the FA banned women's teams from playing at association grounds, for fear that the game could have an adverse effect on the attendances of the Football League. While it is commonly thought that the ban on women's football saw the game disappear completely, the archive shows that games continue to be played throughout the interwar period. The legendary city keeper Dick Pym is said to have been an advocate of women's football and could regularly be seen refereeing charitable matches held in his native Topsham. But even with the support of characters such as Pym, the structure of the game had been badly affected and the numbers of girls at all ages playing the game dwindled dramatically. The ban in 1921 marked a low point for women's football in the UK and it was not until the 1970s that the game began to recover towards its pre-war levels. This was by no means an overnight success, although a women's international played at St James Park in 1978 showcased improving attitudes both locally and nationally. In the modern era, the game is flourishing and the ECFC ladies' side has emerged as an important part of the football club's culture. As part of a wider network of women's football in Exeter, the team provides an example of the growing popularity and improving structure of the game in the region. We spoke to the team's manager, Abby Britton, about her role in promoting the women's game as part of the ECFC Community Trust. I go into schools at the moment and deliver um, after school clubs, predominantly just two girls, um, and seeing their ability grow over a 12 month period mm -hmm. in not just confidence in skill level is, is pretty impressive, you know. And then when they get to that end of year, it's not a case of, well, they've just got to wait till the, till the new season starts or the new year starts. There's now options available for them. So we have a Grecian girls event and a Grecian kickers event where they can come on Friday evenings and play. You know, we've got Premier League kicks that we run pretty much every evening now, which girls can come to and play. And we've, we've 
18 months into our first girls academy that we've got here so it's a development center that you know we're attracting what we like to say would be the the higher end of the skill set of girls ranging from under 12s to under 16s and they're coming in on a Thursday evening for an intense hour and a half training session with our coaches and then with the aim then for them to move up each year group to when they get to the under 16s level and graduate on from there they're going into Exeter College continuing their studies and picking up the partnership that we have with them then as well obviously then once you've turned 16 in women's football you have the ability to to go into senior ladies football and that's something we've got here as well and a senior ladies team so the option for them to sign for us as well and continue their academics continue their development with the college as well getting trained for four times a week as well as then joining in with the ladies training sessions in the evenings and then a match day that's what I cried out for when I was a kid and that's what I had so trying to give them the knowledge that I had from that time and then to where we are now you know, the sky's the limit for these girls coming through at the moment. We also spoke to the Community Trust Donna Langdon about how football for girls has progressed and how the game is growing at all levels. I mean, I've always enjoyed sport from a young age, having an older brother, um, obviously played in school, but um, it was quite difficult because when, obviously when I was young, you could only play football until you were 12 with boys. Um, so I kind of played with boys right until 12 and then got to 12 and it was like, well, you can't play anymore. Um, and at the time there were no grassroots clubs to join either. It was waiting until you were 14 and then you had to go and play for a ladies team, which obviously at 14 playing with older ladies is actually quite difficult, it's a big jump. So um, yeah, so kind of where they've come from today is great. Kind of you can see the progression that ladies football has made. I think a lot of clubs now to kind of be chart standard and things like that, you have to have your kind of women's setup. So clubs are kind of more kind of interesting and more kind of open to kind of ladies kind of set up so yeah it's good I mean I think there's still room for improvement but there definitely has been a progression there so yeah I think the link between the ladies and the men's team has really grown um, obviously the girls kind of go to the men's matches they feature in the program um, you know via social media there's that kind of just that kind of pre-match tweet that says good luck so yeah it's all really nice things to see so yeah I think it's really improved yeah it's good well, obviously with the development centre now and kind of our pathway, hopefully I'd like to see the ladies kind of progress a few leagues, um, maybe even kind of in time have a reserve team. And I think ladies football in general is, you know, it's grown massively, obviously. We've got professional leagues now and you've kind of got clubs like Yeovil who've now got their tier one. Um, so yeah, I think the game is growing and I can only see it kind of getting bigger and bigger. One of the players benefiting from the development of the game is striker Katie Finch who shared her thoughts on what it's like to be part of the ECFC setup. So I work in the community trust, we go to like primary schools, secondary schools, uh, run the youth setup here, helping with the girls and uh, just promoting football within the community really. The setup here now has improved dramatically from last season and uh, we're definitely on the same wavelength as Plymouth now, hoping to go up and make the progress. It's great coming out here, especially at the men training, it just shows like we are part of the club. We get like get to go to the ground, we use their minibuses, we use their facilities, it's just like we are one, one with them. With the setup in place for the development of the team, Abby shared her thoughts on the short-term progress of the team, as well as her hopes for the future of the sport itself. Well, I joined the team this season, so in pre-season, um, having they've just been relegated from the league that they were in. Uh, came to my first pre-season session with about nine girls there. You know, this Saturday when we trained, we had twenty-one there, so. Where we've come from, from June to where we are now, is, is unbelievable and you ask the girls now why they're there, they're there to win the league and it's that attitude has changed just solely by them and the structure that they've had. So in terms of history in women's football, I would say it would just all comes down to structure, how it's going to go in the future, it needs to be structured right. You know, the FA have got all these plans and ideas that they want to impl implement but structure is key. If we can get more clubs to adopt girls teams it's then about pushing them and promoting them and not just having a girls team with no girls in it. Oh but we've got a girls team if we need one. You know going out there and looking hard and standing in the rain and coaching them as well as coaching the boys and yeah it's, it's getting better but there's obviously still gaps that need to be filled. While the sport continues to evolve on the pitch it is also off the pitch that women play a vital role throughout the football season. 
From a historical perspective, the first female employee can be traced back to Patricia Smith, who became the club secretary in 1964, and since then numerous women have held important roles right across the club. The formation of the Trust in 2000 and its purchase of the club in 2003 led to a number of prominent women being involved at boardroom level, including Frances Farley, who was appointed as the first female director of the club, and Denise Watts, who became not only the first female chair of Exeter City, but also the first to congratulate her team at the New Wembley, as City won the playoff final in 2007. Following in their footsteps today is Elaine Davies, who having worked as a volunteer and fundraiser for the club was co-opted to the Trust Board in 2014. She spoke to us about her thoughts on the positive role of women at the club today. Exeter City is a good example because you've got women at all levels. So you've got women doing traditional women roles as volunteers who are in the Clapham Fiddle, or sorry, Cliff Hill, looking after the players. You've got the professional women in the offices and in the, in the support staff for the team. And you've got volunteer trustees, officers, and myself, who at the minute is on the board. And I'm not the first one, so I'm following on. So we are at all levels. We'd just be nice if there are a few more of us. Beyond the boardroom at Exeter City, both staff and volunteers are a vital part of the organisation. One of the most active volunteers is Jenny Lees, who has worked with both the Community Trust and the First Team Squad. I started off being secretary to football in the community and then was asked would I help at the, well as then in those days with Captain Fiddle which is now Cliff Hill and that's how I started here. I actually feel um, a part of a team because um, no one person does it here. Um, I, I feel valued as a member of that team and it's also good leadership. And, um, you know, there's good, I call it good parenting goes on. <laughs> of course, one of the largest and most significant roles played by women in football is by the fans. From the early images of ladies dotted around the terraces, today we see more women of all ages in the crowd than ever before, while over 15% of the club's trust membership is made up of female fans. We spoke to Sarah Willis, the editor of the fanzine Some Sunny Day, about her experience of being a fan. I started coming in the late 80s with my dad um, when I was about eight years old. He brought me along um, because he was a City fan and then obviously we saw the 89 championship year which was a great time to be a City fan. Right through the 90s I uh, did a lot of away games um, and then when I came back from university came back um, and started getting involved with the club. I wrote for the match day programme for three seasons. Uh, and then eventually became involved in the fanzine. The thing about being a football fan is that if you have those shared experiences with people, it doesn't really matter if you're a man or a woman. The, there's a bit of a pecking order in football fandom and that's to do with how long you've been a fan. So as long as you've, you've been a fan and you've been to those games and you've had those experiences, you, you can still be accepted into, into that into that arena and I think my dad always taught me that I knew as much about it as anyone else because we've been to all these games and you know we've been following City for so long and I always felt like I belonged here that it was my place and when you come back here you know you have a real sense of familiarity and it feels like coming home because it's a huge part of your childhood. 